Good afternoon, everybody, and a big, big welcome to the webinar focused on mixed use, work, rest, or play, and play. Um, and I wanted to say a big, big thank you to all those beautiful people that you see on your screen at the moment for making the Urban Living Light webinar series such a success. There's around 40 people that have contributed uh, towards it, and this is the sixth one of uh, eight. There are two more uh, happening tomorrow, which I'll just highlight to you later on in the session. The, yeah, the um, webinars are here really as a, as a taster for something which is really exciting. We're gonna deliver it a, a year late, unfortunately, due to COVID, but there's a live event, which I encourage everybody to get involved with. It's called the Urban Living Festival. July the 7th to the 8th happening at Tobacco Dock in London and here's a little taste of video of what to expect. We've all witnessed the speed of change at which the world is evolving and the Urban Living Festival is now so more relevant than ever as we look to define the future of hospitality and real estate. Urban Living Festival came about really based around a lot of different hospitality and real estate asset classes all converging really at the same time. You've got co-work, co-live, PRS, built to rent, student housing. The big idea really was ultimately quite simple to bring everybody together so i'm really looking forward to attracting i'd say you know real estate and hospitality urban innovators to explore what i suppose urban living actually is it's a thought leadership forum as much as it is a forum for business i know i'm going to learn a lot and i'm going to learn a lot about everybody that plays in it providers suppliers tech accounting services, all of the pieces that you need to make your business successful. I'll learn a lot there. However far technology moves along, people will always have the need to come together, to socialize, to work and collaborate together, uh, to be hospitable uh, and basically to be social animals. Okay, so I hope to see, uh, see you there. Um, these webinars wouldn't have been possible without our sponsor, Yardi. So here's a, a short promo video of the services that they provide. Okay, big, big thank you to Yardi and their contact details uh, are in the, the chat function on the uh, webinar. So a bit of um, housekeeping, everybody who's joining us um, is on auto mute. Do get involved in the conversation via the chat function, trying to make it as interactive as possible and we'll keep our eyes uh, on that. A recording will be sent to everybody of, uh, of the session um, tomorrow. And yeah, please use the Q&A 
uh, box if you have got some questions to ask. All our contributors' uh, LinkedIn profiles will be posted in the chat as well, so you can connect with, uh, with uh, everybody um, using that. Okay, I'm Piers, Piers Brown, um, host for the Urban Living Festival. I just really enjoy connecting uh, people and hopefully facilitating business. Okay, a bit of context for the uh, discussion uh, today. Um, as you can see, these are recent news stories really that Urban Living um, has run. Um, and the pace of change, I think, with what's happening on the high street and to urbanization has perhaps been sped up by the crisis based on the velocity of uh, news stories that we've run. I think that's just a sample of the last month um, there. Next slide, please, Justin. Okay. Okay, to give the session a bit of context, um, you can see a, a definition for mixed use uh, there. And I think, you know, lots and lots of real estate and hospitality asset classes are converging, but I just felt we needed a bit of a, a definition. <clears throat> I won't read every one of them out, but do just uh, have a scan of those. But I will read um, just one. Let me see if I can kill my slides here. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, I can't because I can't see the end of my screen, but um, I hope everybody can there. Okay, so on to our speakers. And before they introduce themselves, to liven it up and give the webinar a bit of personality, so to speak, here's a quick, I won't say who done it, that's not the right phrase, but here is a secret about one of our speakers that I'll reveal at the end. Which one of our speakers has never had a drink of alcohol? That is one. And the second, which we've only found out today, is which one of our speakers has lived with the parents of another of our speakers on the topic today? Have a think about that. Have a look at their LinkedIn profiles, maybe. Some clues there or not? Okay, without further ado, Richard, could you introduce yourself and we'll go from left to right, uh, Owen. So if Owen's next. Great, Richard. Uh, uh, thanks, Piers. Yeah, well, without wanting to give anything away, you don't get to look as good at this just by drinking alcohol. So, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, the, um, yeah, I'm sort of uh, head of strategy and enterprise at Housie. Housie is a, a digital um, rental and management business, primarily for uh, retail buy-to-let landlords. But uh, most recently, and it's my role, is to start to sort of roll out what we do to uh, institutional and corporate clients as well. So fundamentally, we're sort of focusing on a frictionless um, lease up and management business, you know, which is uh, augmented by technology, which is, which is what we do. Uh, outside of that, I spent the last 20 years, I guess, in residential investment and development. Um, I've worked for uh, residential land, I've worked with uh, Ivanhoe Cambridge and uh, Apollo Global Real Estate. And I suppose in the last 10 years, probably since just before the release of the Montague Report, which is about institutional investment, um, I've been involved pretty much all the time in build to rent, either in the um, viability stage or in management stage, uh, development or acquisitions. Thank you, Richard. Um, yep, yeah, hello there. I'm, I'm Owen Conroy. Um, so I uh, work with uh, U Group or U, U Development specifically. Um, <coughs> U Group was founded about 20 years ago by Philippe Stark and John Hitchcock uh, based on this thesis. This, this thesis that a relentless focus on community, on design quality, and with this forward looking attitude towards lifestyle and lifestyle needs um, could add value to real estate. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean always using the most expensive materials or, uh, you know, the, 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 the most challenging design, but it, it does mean about clever thinking and clever approach. Um, and over the years, you know, that, that, that sort of philosophy has gone from single buildings 
to entire estates. We have an 850 acre estate out in the Cotswolds called the Lakes Bayou um, uh, and uh, you know, into large scale mixed use developments, which are, I guess, to take the more traditional view of what placemaking is, you know, those schemes are very much the embodiment of that. Uh, consistently taking that philosophy and thesis um, you, know, uh, you know, and applying it to each project that we do. Um, and so I have the, uh, the pleasure of being able to, uh, to spearhead some of those projects. Thanks, Alain. Neil? Yeah, thanks, Piers. Um, so my name is Neil Davis. Um, I practice as Neil Davis Architect. Um, we've been going uh, for about nine years now, just over nine years. Um, and we're design-led practice in, in West London and in New York. Um, and we are all about uh, sort of creative reuse of existing buildings. So uh, I've personally been involved in that for the last kind of 22 years. Um, but uh, we are working with um, some really exciting emerging brands in the kind of co-living um, and service, uh, service mm -hmm. apartment extended stay um, sectors, um, kind of repurposing old hotels. There's a couple of projects we're doing at the moment in, in West London in that regard. Um, but we're also pushing into um, you know, emerging technologies of how you actually deliver those projects. So you know, utilizing um, the latest uh, of off-site technologies. And uh, it's, not, it's not a whim. Um, you know, we're speaking some of the, uh, the best alternative industries, you know, learning from Formula One, um, learning from boat building, um, and kind of really repurposing that into, into our offering. So yeah, we, are, we are right at the cutting edge and, uh, and pushing it on. So uh, yeah, exciting, exciting things ahead. And we're, we're, we're just we're really happy to be in this, uh, in this place. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Marlowe? Great, Marlowe Sknipmerk. I'm the CEO of Kirton Hospitality. We are a mixed use operator um, founded over almost six years ago now, um, when we saw that people were looking for hotel brands, uh, using them for service departments, branded residences, um, developed our own brands, The House and Cloud7, which we apply for mid-market uh, for Cloud7 and, and upscale a premium product for The House. And then we could see that the meeting spaces were pretty much empty. Um, and we developed a, a serviced office concept, which was very much focused on business club, business hub, uh, a more sophisticated audience under our space. And then um, as we couldn't really find the FMB brands we wanted, we started developing a couple of FMB brands, but wherever we can, we like to collaborate with other brands from breakfast experience to anything else. Um, we have five openings going on as we speak, I'm actually in Jeddah on, on one of our openings uh, now. Um, and um, we have a, we're mainly focused on the, on the GCC, or that's what it has been for a few years, and now are tackling Mediterranean. But we really go into countries where um, there is a lack of lifestyle kind of projects. There's a need of repurposing. Um, and there's a, a greater demand of a, the kind of new style of, uh, of living. Thanks, Marlon. Holly? Hi, I'm, um, I'm Holly Mitchell. I'm a director with Simply Planning. We're a, we're a planning consultancy. We've got offices in London, Birmingham and Cardiff. Um, we mostly specialize in advising private clients um, on development opportunities, planning risks, and probably most importantly, um, how to get your development through planning and into development, dealing with local authorities and uh, their requirements. Um, I'm working on uh, a, lot, a lot of different schemes, actually. Planning hasn't, um, hasn't been slowed down. I think that's probably because we're getting all the planning consents in place so that when we all come out of lockdown and we can start building again, um, everyone's going to be ready, ready to go. I'm working on um, a full range of housing schemes, um, some build to rent, uh, service departments, tall buildings, um, all of which have an element of some kind of mixed use in them, whether that's because that's what the developer wants to bring forward as their, as their product. You know, in, in some of the cases we build to rent the product and making sure that people want to live there is the most important part about creating communities and making sure people want to stay there for a long time and carry on living there throughout their lives, or whether it's because the planning authority want to make the developer provide some jobs or some 
retail or something that gives back to the fact that they're turning old industrial sites into residential. Um, I think that planning, certainly planning in the UK is, is quite a fast moving, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit slow in getting through the process, but I think there are a lot of changes that are going on at the moment. There's a lot of changes to permitted development rights, and there's a lot of changes that are trying to give flexibility. And I think that both developers and also councils are struggling to see how they can apply that whilst making sure that they're looking after and testing all the impacts of development and making sure that it, it, you know, it's all acceptable. Okay, thank you, uh, everybody. So clearly you're, you know, everybody's super, super active at the, at the moment. Um, where's the opportunity for, for mixed use then? You know, COVID, as, as I think we said uh, earlier, has probably sped a lot of things up within hospitality and, and real estate. So maybe yourself, Owen, um, how are you trying to sail through the storm um, and with your projects highlighting maybe the benefits, could you highlight some, maybe some of the benefits of mixed use to the audience that we've got uh, today? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I, th I think a lot of, um, you know, I think COVID's taught us a lot of lessons. Um, um, one of the key takeaway lessons that I've, I've had throughout this pandemic has been um, that, that, that this and the sort of medium that we're using today to communicate are, uh, you know, exceptional tools and they are exceptionally helpful. But what they're not a replacement for is human engagement and human contact and interface and sitting across the meeting room table from somebody and building that personal relationship and connection. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we had a sort of freedom, if you will, taken away from us, um, it's, it's, it's amazing how much we pined for that human interaction again. And I think within that, there's a sort of a clue as to what the future for mixed use development holds. Um, you know, we have always we have always taken approach in the projects that we're doing, um, you know, from from a sort of a, a ground level up that we want to create spaces that people want to be in, that whether that's living or working or playing or what have you. And we want these to be hubs of activity, whether it's a single building or whether it's a, an entirety or a cluster of buildings. We want these to be desirable places to be. Um, and, and that's all about, in many ways, about bringing people together. But it's also about recognizing that, um, you know, that people's ways of working, living and playing are constantly changing. And so we need to think from the outset about the adaptability of what our projects are. So I think we've, um, you know, we, we've always sort of had that as a sort of a cornerstone of what we wanted to do. And it's, it's interesting that increasingly developers, investors and policymakers are sort of waking up to the advantages of that mixed use, um, you know, arrangement. To, to some degree, buildings have always been sort of mixed use. To, you know, most buildings are mixed use by nature. They might have a retail on the ground floor and offices above. Um, but I think, I think people recognize now that there's a de-risking element to mixed use, which from an investment and a development perspective is interesting. Um, it's, it's harder, but it's, it's more interesting and safer. And then the, the policymakers are, are recognizing that, you know, they don't want whole sections of a city to shut down at 5 p.m. on a Friday, you know, that they want that continual buzz, that 18-7 environment that mixed use can create through, you know, various different strata of uses, whether they be living or working or playing or what have you. Um, and so I think, uh, and, and, I, and I think all of that combined sort of dovetails into this whole concept of placemaking. You know, for me, the traditional view of placemaking is, is taking a big chunk of land and then molding that into something. But actually, placemaking is also about what a building or what a contributing factor to a local environment has on its wider surrounds. You know, how it influences that, whether it be socially, economically, aesthetically, or, or, or what have you. Um, and, and mixed use as, as, as a concept has such a bearing and a weighting um, on how it influences its surrounds and how it influences the concept of placemaking. So I think we've, I don't know if I'm answering the question per se, but I guess what we're saying is we've always sort of, you know, because we've always taken that approach from day one, it's never really held up or it's never really majorly affected the direction of travel that we were intending to go on from the beginning. And so I think we've got a lot of support and confidence from policymakers, from um, partners, operators and investors, because they recognize what we're trying to do. They recognize that even in a post COVID world, 
that approach is is got merits and that actually there are other asset classes and other traditional ways of doing development that actually now need to adapt to respond to that. Um, and so, of course, it's, it sounds like a bit of a pat in the back here. We're more confident about what we're doing, but that's not detracting away from the fact that there's a sort of a seismic impact on the wider real estate industry about uh, focusing them to think a little bit harder about what they're doing and how they're doing it and, and what role mixed use has to play. Um, rather than just being specialist developers anymore, I think now people have to think a little bit harder about what it is that do that, that adds value. And you know, Hammerson, for example, is almost like a bit of a case study of that, where they said, "Look, this is what we're doing, retail," and and now they're recognising, well, actually, to 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 be flexible, to adapt, to be future proof, to to deal with the changes in society and flexibility and lifestyle going forward. I now need to do a bit of resi, a bit of hospitality, a bit of retail, a bit of offices. And, and so that's almost like intrinsic of, of sort of where I think the general industry is going to have to go. I, so, think, I think in terms of the, I think in terms of 2020, I mean, aside from, um, you know, some horrendous stories and, you know, some, and some real, real struggles that people are going to have and have had, like, you know, during, during these kind of the, the, the stay-at-home orders and the, and the various kind of lockdowns that we've had to, had to endure last year. But... I, you know, just in terms of kind of building use, I think we will look back at 2020 as a watershed moment about single use buildings. And we will look, we will look back in 20, 30 years time and say, God, can you imagine, you know, there was just an office building that that's all it was. And, you know, to follow on from Julian's point is, is that, you know, essentially, you know, that it goes to sleep, you know, it kind of is, is shut up at you know, five o'clock on a Friday evening and it's not even touched, it's not even used all weekend unless someone comes in and does something. But you know, it's really completely dormant, and then it kind of fires up again on Monday. I, I just, you know, I think the whole idea of, you know, sort of looking at how you can kind of build in all these different uses to give its vibrancy, you know, throughout its, you know, throughout its its time, you know, during the day and night and all the rest of it is is incredibly important. Um, you know, not notwithstanding the kind of sustainability point, but just, you know, that. I just think it's it's going to be seen to be such an outmoded concept that you know you just have these buildings that the lights are still on, but yeah, that, that, I mean there's literally nobody in. And uh, you know, I think I think the certainly the the ability you know during last year to be able to to have a little bit of a pause and just and and actually think about that, you know, because everyone's you know constantly just like busy, busy, busy. Just just think, hang on, guys, like what are we? What we're actually doing here and, and taking stock and really addressing things has actually has been a good thing um you know in order to either prove okay yeah i'm on the right track i'm doing the right thing or just or to question the question that the established norms um, that have been you know kind of established for years um and you know is it the right is it the right model anymore um you know and uh, and so yeah i i, I mean i totally i echo yeah, you know, in points that you, you're bang on, like in terms of you know how you're creating those communities, you know, and 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 it, but it, it requires it requires a lot of work. You know, it's not easy, and it's a lot of cu curation and how you know thinking about it from a briefing point of view, lobbying the right people, the planners that you know everyone has to play play their part in you know creating something that's really vibrant and has long levity. Um, but it's it yeah, I I mean I'd like to go back to kind of the point I just. I just think that the kind of single-use buildings are just a toast. They, they are they are over. I mean, I think it's I think it's the end of them. Yeah, to be honest. But I think there's just two two points to that. Is you know when we talk about the operations of these buildings, we'll, we still talk in silos. So a lot of operators at the moment are trying to build their own brands for for everything. I think the one piece that's still really missing is the collaboration. And even when somebody says that, you know, there was already mixed use buildings. Yeah, just in as in multiple facets in one building. Yes. But, you know, when you go to retail and your point of sale is the same as when you go to the office or there is the integration or there's the B2B community, there's very little still out there. And I think there's another piece which is still people build a building and then find that community and start curating that community. And then everybody's kind of hitting that same community. When you look at really the traditional nomads, they, they were a community and traveled as a community to look for what they wanted and needed. So I can see even in the future where 
you know, there's probably people are forming different types of communities with different needs, with different connection points. And probably where the need is going is to build buildings or developments or compounds or whatever it is around or for those specific communities instead of everybody saying, oh, we have too many rooms, so let's take two floors out and make them office. And then say, oh, let's meet at room 207. Um, and then, you know, kind of like, let's let's all do the kind of bar nights, etc. I don't think that's necessarily the answer to, you know, where the real estate at the moment is. I'm really interested to know whether the way that COVID has changed where people are and where they're working and where they're living, whether that's going to have a real change and um, in terms of which locations we're going to put these mixed use buildings and where the opportunities are and you know, you sort of find these places generally within cities, you know, London, prime prime sites, but there are so many more places where people are living at home. I mean, I live in a market town and the market town has, whilst a lot of stuff has been closed, the market town has really um, benefited in some ways from people living closer, not commuting into London for work. And I'm, I'm interested to see whether it's going to throw up some more opportunities for where these buildings could go and where we, where we form these communities. I think I think it's more even um, on a almost on a tech level. I mean, you know, so one of uh, kind of a couple of conversations I've had with uh, with a, with a lawyer a few weeks ago, and he, he coined this great statement where it's just the limitation is bandwidth. You know, really, um, you you can work anywhere. I mean, uh, that will be for a certain kind of job and a certain and a certain probably a certain socioeconomic standing. But yeah, really, if you've got if you've got access to internet. You could, in theory, work anywhere. Okay, time differences aside, but yeah, that 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 is a real game changer. I mean, it's always been there. It's never really been deployed. But you know, if I want to go and work in the Middle East, you know, for a couple of weeks, travel permitting, I can as long as I can kind of manage the different time zones. But you know, and would anyone know? Well, okay, I might not be meeting them in person, but you know, why not? You know, and and you know, I think that that can completely open up a whole world of possibility that's incredibly exciting and, you know kind of meeting you know exposing yourself to different cultures you know that would feed into your work if you decided to work I don't know somewhere in in Europe and then you, you went to the States and I mean it's yeah the, the possibilities are endless. This, this is a bit of a zeitgeist moment for the real estate industry because what we thought we knew we've had to chuck into the bin really yeah. and there's a lot of things yeah. and there's a lot of things that um, have been going on that were obviously very, very wrong. I mean, you're talking about sort of siloed buildings with only one use in it and um, communities coming together and, you know, and it's, and it's not really working. Uh, communities, and going back to sort of, you know, Holly's point, communities are really, really very organic uh, elements in, to them and they sort of come about, they coalesce through their own will and interests. And it's, it's really quite difficult for us to give our heads around. I know we want to do this. I know we want to look at mixed use places, mixed use buildings, community community places, but it's really hard for us to get us our heads around an organic entity when we're trying to actually curate it. And curating is a really, really hard job because there are so many moving points and targets in that that we have to take into consideration. I mean, you know, so we've had COVID, which has been, which has dealt you know, real estate industry with a bit of a bit of a bit of a wake up call. But just before that, you know, retail was already going through, you know, a real substantial transition. And you know, we can we still you know, still remember, you know, into you sending out emails saying we're going to start talking about residential on top of our blocks and that sort of stuff. But then into is no more. So uh, well, because it just didn't survive doing what it's doing. And you know, the references to Hammers Hammerson earlier. They were deeply involved in, in, in offices at one point and they just turned around to everybody and said, we're going to give offices up and then we're going to move into retail. <laughs> Brilliant thought process by those guys. They obviously didn't see the internet and the <laughs> paper click coming, coming down the line. But, you know, we've, you know we've, there's a lot of thought that we've got to put into how we're going to create places for the future because it, the future is mixed use, you know, almost inevitable with uh, a multi-use. We've got to think about well, let's just have a look at what co how co-living has evolved in its very short lifetime. Some of the bigger schemes started out as purely residential schemes with resident amenities. 
Now they're looking at, you know, well, let's have some co-living space in and let's have some other entertainment space all occupied by other users and not simply for the benefit of, of, of our residents, but for other people too. And that's all happened over three years. And so that evolution has been remarkably fast. You know, I don't think that, you know, co-living would exist with or would survive today as it originally started out maybe three years ago because I don't think that model particularly works very well, but it works much better as a mixed use model. So I think, you know, what we're probably going to see is a lot of evolution, a lot of thinking about it, and a lot of more thought into what community actually is. Yeah, I, 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 I do agree with that. One of the things I failed to mention in my introduction is that one of the things that we're doing is, is rolling out a platform of what we call these curated living communities. And, um, you know, I, I sort of, I, I sort of um, smile a little bit because some people say, oh, well, that's just a fancy way of saying co-living. But I say, no, it's not. Because, because the, way, the, way, the way I look at co-living, and this is not fair, it's a, it's a bit of a generalization, that it, it has this perception rightly or wrongly as being almost like glorified student accommodation. And it's, and it's you know, very cluster flappy. And, and that's not always the case. But, but for me, the approach that we've taken from the outset was we want these to be mixed use communities within the volume of the building, if it has to be, quite often more than that. And that these buildings are not just about the people that live in here, they are about uh, the people that live outside of that building as well too. Because for this to be a success, there has to be something that the community embrace, that they can benefit from, that they can resource. And that's what creates the, 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 that's what creates the buzz, that was, that's what creates the inter, uh, integration. Um, and that's almost, almost like a microcosm of a successful mixed use development, which is, what are you doing? that benefits beyond just the people that live there. And, and I think, um, you know, that's certainly been our mantra. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't think we'd even entertain a three-year-old concept of what co-living is because that doesn't make sense for what we want to do as a business, nor do we feel that that's what, you know, that's where the world is going. Um, but just, just one, one point that, I, that was raised earlier about, um, you know, can these mixed use communities live live everywhere is you know there's been some pretty i think dramatic statements made about you know, the death knell of city centers and and the offices and and, and i not by this forum but but you know <laughs> outside of this forum and, and i just have this view that rightly or wrongly that you know i i don't see london city dying on its feet neither do i actually even see canary wharf or anything like that i think what we're having to do is to think about how we live and work and what COVID has, has taught us is that, yes, as Neil says, the ability to, uh, to, 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 to kind of work from various different locations is now, is now possible. But I still go back to my earlier point, which is I don't believe it's a replacement for human interaction, human engagement, the creativity that you get just hiving off your colleagues or, or your, your team in a meeting room. That yields so much more intangibles than you'll ever get over a Zoom call. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, so I think there's always a place for that. I just think how it's used will change. And, and I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going to start crazy working from home. So I, uh, I, I'm looking forward to the idea, even, even if it's a Monday and Friday working from home, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in London, then, then that, that, that's good for me. And if anything, I think you know, we were all complaining about not getting a seat on the train before this pandemic. Well, maybe that more flexible way of living and working not only benefits from a well-being perspective, mentally, socially, emotionally, all those things, work-life balance, but actually puts less pressure on infrastructure as well too, um, and and makes makes going to London a much more or, or any other major city um, a more enjoyable experience. Uh, you know, and I think that's something that we should be be thinking about as well. I'm interested yeah. in what you say about your developments and them being outward-facing in terms of how you get communities involved and how it becomes a benefit to the communities. Because I have to say that some of my experience has been that very much with um, the products that people are bringing forward as built to rent or you want to provide everything to keep your residents there and your residents in and to look after your residents. And it's how do you make that something that integrates into the surrounding community and links to it. And I think that's a real challenge because where you've got people who are or where you've got businesses that are set up purely to kind of keep their own residents, keep renting a place, moving through the process, staying there, using those facilities. Why would you share that with the community and how do you share that with the community? And on the I, other side, how do you provide the, you know, if you're building a pure build to sale, just a normal residential scheme, 
you're prob probably not so worried. You just want to get your things sold and get them off. You want them to look nice in the first place and you want people to buy them and you want it to be in an area where it looks good and people have got a shop and somewhere to go to a cafe. But after you've sold them, who looks after those areas? Who makes sure they continue to work? And I think this is where we've got attention and this is where we all need to kind of work out how we fit together and how we work together. I mean, I don't know if it appears that this is straight, strays into the, the, the whole kind of flexibility <laughs> point, but um, if, if I could just very quickly just respond to Holly, if I may, one of the things that I think is really important is that that, that view of let's just build some houses and sell them and once I've sold them, I'm kind of done. I just think that is such an antiquated way of looking at, uh, at real estate. And, uh, uh, you know, my, our, our view, and I'm only speaking for ourselves, is that actually the way you retain people is not by providing them a gym that nobody uses because it's, you know, it's a marketing tool or it's not, um, you know, providing kind of nominal co-work space on a, on, a, on a corner over here or a nice cafe or a sky lounge. These are all just kind of um, marketing brochure sale pieces. Yeah, uh, the, difficulty, I, 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 the difficulty there, and it still comes back, correct? Even if you say it and you put it nicely, whose point of sale are you going to use? Which P&L are you going to showcase? You know, this is, I think, oh. the piece where when you go to middleware, like we're all still looking at technology, taking a PMS or a whatever, you know, all of the points are just individual systems. When you look at the amount of middleware out there at the moment that you can take off the shelf, it's very minimal. So, you know, to Holly's point, even if you wanted to do this different, who's going to pay for the cost? Who's going to put in the infrastructure? Who's going to, you know, from the beginning and the planning piece do that? When you manage the entire building, it's much easier because it's just one-on-one. Well, that's, well, well, that's what I mean, that's the question. That's what we're doing. So, you know, the, 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 po the point is that for us, we can't live and breathe and preach unless we actually take responsibility for it ourselves. And we have to recognize that we're real estate people. We don't have the answers for every single service solution in, in the building. So we need to partner with people that, um, that, that, that can help us to do that, to achieve the service, to achieve the quality, to achieve the engagement. But it needs to be done in such a way that the ultimate control of a building point the accountability ends with one party the champion of that concept but the individual service points can be partnerships with the best in class and so i think if we if we just simply think of a building as well look we'll do this and then you do that and then you do that and we expect it to be a co cohesive project and a cohesive cohesive success well then we're sort of setting ourselves up to failure because we all have slightly different agendas then um, different systems different methods and so our, our, our view is that whether it's a mixed use community or it's a building you do need to take that more overarching view and responsibility for delivering on your on your ideas, your concept. And you, you have to take a leadership role. If you don't take a leadership role, nobody else is going to follow. Well, we've, we've, seen, we've seen this in the past, haven't we? I mean, we've got some great examples of stewardship models that have worked in London and other parts of uh, other parts of, of the UK. We think, for instance, of the Grosvenor Estates or how's the hold how the Walden Estates or Malden Estates. Yeah. These guys have been involved and invested in these areas for a very long time. Mayfair wouldn't be what it is today without the involvement of, of, of the Grosvenor Estate continually upgrading it. I don't know if you've, yeah. anybody's been there recently, I probably haven't been there recently, but if you look at just very simply what they did to, what they did to Mount Street, they turned mm -hmm. it into a fairly dreary, I mean, it was obviously a start market street, but it was a fairly dreary street. And they started to look at pedestrianisation of those areas. And, and you know, it's not just them. They're also the Cadogan Estate has done the same just off, you yeah. know, just off Lane Square. So yeah. this sort of model, you, we've got this continual sort of investment in an area because you are literally invested in it. And I think you know the the point about the single point of contact or the single management model is really important. But there aren't many really good examples of that outside some of the great estates where they have an, an overall knowledge of retail, of office, of residential, yeah. different types of residential schemes and different types of tenure. Mixed tenure is a really important thing to bring in a mixed community. You can't just have it all sale or all rent, or you've got to have a mix of affordable rent of, 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 of for sale. The people who buy the, who actually buy the flats or houses are involved in, in literally investing in that area, investing in that community. Whereas in some of the people who perhaps are renting are not so invested, but become more so because they integrate with other tenure uh, individuals. So you know, we have those examples and it's great to look back at some of these things. And yeah. it's also good to look back at what didn't work. For instance, Build to Rent, it's been around for years. 
you know, we looked at, say, for instance, um, some of the early buildings, uh, build, early buildings built before the First World War. Some of those were huge schemes, Dolphin Square, for instance. That has probably is probably the biggest um, single it's a cluster of buildings, but buildings uh, in Europe in terms of built to rent. And then you've got that uh, Duquesne Court down in Ballon. It was the biggest under one roof in Europe, just sort of 600 flats. That didn't work. Why didn't that work? Because the Second World War came along, people fled London and the, and the owners went bust. So we have to look at, you know, and we've got COVID at the moment, which are challenging our ideals, challenging our, our concepts about what works and what doesn't. You know, COVID has challenged, go back to co-living, has challenged co-living because as we, we think, as we, if we think about it as clusters, because go, who wants to live in like a 17 square metre box when you can't use the gym and, and all the other lovely communal spaces that go and make up for what you're paying for. So, you know, we're constantly challenged you know, uh, about how our models work and how robust they are. And I think it's a good thing sometimes that things like, you know, it's not good things for people, but good things that COVID comes along to challenge our models so that in the future, we build something that really, really does work. As I mean, you, you did write about, you know, sort of citing, you know, the examples of the, of the areas of, of you know, certain tracts of London, you know, the estates that, that do work and do endure, you know, you, you, you write your kind of Katugans and your, your Groveners and things like that. And that is that on a, on a kind of an urban scale, on a, um, on a, you know, sort of streetscape scale, you know, how that is curated and how that, you know, how that, that works. I think the, the, the challenge when you get down to just buildings in terms of, you know, cause, cause, you know, and you're talking about, you know, sort of, a developer and you're creating a product and you know whether that ends up being whether that's propco or not co or a, a combination of those two i think what we've got to look at and you've got to strip it right back to the to the to the to the, the beginning about if you're creating a new building or you're creating a series of buildings you know do those buildings fundamentally work and would they stand the test of time in a hundred years time you know, so, you know, if you apply the, you know, the Victorian terrace, now Victorian terrace can be adaptable in numerous ways, you know, it can run house, then it's flats, then it's a doctor's surgery and you name it, anything in between, then it turns back into a house again and all that sort of stuff in just one little Victorian terrace, you know, in a fairly kind of standardised kind of form. Now, they were never thinking about that when they, when they created them, but, you know, that, that, you know, is, is a really good model to kind of go to, to think, right, okay, some of the buildings that we are creating now are very, they, kept, they are very one-trick ponies, you know, and they, they're not going to be adaptable in time. And I don't think they are going to be around in a hundred years time, certainly not in the current, current, um, you know, current kind of form that they're in. And so there's a real challenge for kind of design, both designers, both um, owners, both all the kind of parties that, you know, all the team that kind of involves in, in any building to, to really see okay, you know, can this thing be replanned? Even on a short term, if it doesn't really work in kind of five, 10 years time, can it be ripped out, start again, do something else, change it, you know, all of this sort of stuff, but design it in a certain way so that it is sustainably responsible, so that, you know, you're minimizing waste and it, you know, it does, you know, does the building and the way it's designed trap toxins that are harmful to health with all the new building products that we, uh, you know, we have. Where is all the, where are the materials coming from in the world? You know, are they being flown over from China or being cut out of a hill in, you know, an Italian hillside? You know, is that sustainable? And, and all, uh, there's a lot of factors in all of this stuff, but, you know, we really, we've got to work much, much harder in terms of creating buildings that are great now and could be great for five, 10 years time. Um, and they will work and they kind of, you know, all these people that are using them, but, uh, uh, can be repurposed and rethought again in a hundred years time because that is the test that is that is what we absolutely have to do right now and we're not doing it and we've been lazy and now we've got this nice shock of like covid to kind of really challenge us and go hold on guys are we doing enough here because you know that's that's you know that's our generation's challenge now to really bring it and really kind of push on creating the framework that will allow the adaptability going forwards. You know, it's, uh, you know, Marlis, I mean, you, you said something really interesting in a, in a kind of podcast la last year about, you know, bringing, you know, people having all their stuff around them and, you know, being able to kind of have, you know, that, 
that but that kind of dovetails with what you do and you know how you sort of think of your framework i mean what how how do you kind of view it as a you know sort of in the hospitality and, and kind of the products you know and the, and the stuff that you have i think um you know if i take this just a, a bit further i think we're looking at the moment at um how's retail going to integrate um, we're really taking a kind of that even like the living experience where before it was the long and the short term stay in one building. It's and then you had a, a co working space or whatever. The integration of that work component into the living piece, the retail coming into those buildings, but not just into the buildings, but into um, the units. We're looking a lot at second tier and third tier locations. Um, because I think there is a great opportunity because when you look at serviced living, it's always been kind of that five star tier um, that was that was first. Um, and I think now there is a there is a great demand and a great opportunity at that mid market, if you want to call it three star, four stars, if you want to glue any stars to it. Um, but I think the next piece on that is, you know, this conversation on sustainability that is snowballing at the moment. And then there is the conversation on repurposing, you know, all of a sudden there's too much office space and, you know, there is a willingness to put in insane MEP to convert office space into smaller studios or units. And I'm not sure that is necessarily the answer, you know, this kind of quickly, quickly doing something. And I, I come back to that collaboration piece, because if you have a Let's say you have a hotel next to an office building. There's nothing to say that you couldn't combine those two. And it's just a matter of, you know, who's responsible for which piece? Where do you put the infrastructure? Because, you know, we, we looked at it from our perspective in the beginning of, you know, what are our own brands when you do your own development? When I look here, for example, in a location, we have 114 keys. We've taken out the entire meeting floor. There's 14 restaurants of which we manage one, but we build the B2B community. We manage the entire infrastructure. So, you know, it's it's very labor intensive to go down that route of a, of a project this scale. So I can barely imagine how that goes when you're looking at massive size developments and, you know, who's going to make the first step, et cetera. So I think with regards to collaboration, it will go so much further than just, you know, put a few brands into a building and see that you can do something together. Yeah. put a marketing pot together and, you know, see if you can attract everybody. I, you know, I really think that even from a legislation perspective, once everybody starts converting and repurposing their buildings, I'm sure somebody will pull a stop because, you know, saying sustainable and then flying wood from Timbuktu, you know, to wherever you are, um, it's not going to be any more sustainable than just really looking at it in a, in a very localized manner. I think we're, if you look at the regions we've focused on, they might not been so developed when you look at it from a conceptual perspective and they've definitely not invented lifestyle. But when you look from a technology perspective, 70% of the GCC is under 30. For them, technology is like normal. We talk about technology like it's the newest and the latest innovation, like, oh my goodness. You know, for them, it's so normal that when you go down that route, you start looking not just at the building, but you start looking at the facilities, you start looking at the options and the building comes second almost versus looking at what can we do with that, with that asset and, and just the neighborhood around. I think there's so much that is already going so much faster forward that if we continue to do it that same way that we're already talking about for the last two, three years, by the time the buildings are repurposed, they're out of fashion again. Yeah, I think, I think just, you know, it's an interesting point because if, you know, it, it is very much about taking, taking the view of what is the experience? What, what am I trying to create here? Uh, and the building is the enabler of that, but it's the experience that's driving the, the direction of travel. And there's just one or two points that, I mean, um, you know, R Richard and, and, and Neil picked up on as well, too, which is about you know, the, the adaptability of buildings and, um, and you know, how, you know if, if we design things to be just like a one trick pony, well, uh, you know, are we really boxing clever? And I, th I think what's interesting for us, if I just put my pure development hat on for a second, is that there's been a move and there's, a, there's an increased understanding of what institutional capital is looking for. Because gone are the days 
where you put in a Sainsbury's on the ground floor and you assume that that covenant on a 20 year lease is part of your underwrite strategy and that's what makes it fundable and that's what will draw, drive football and that's what will give you financial comfort and security as part of your investment. You know, the whole, the whole idea is that good placemaking is the new underwrite, it is the new covenant. Because if you create places where people want to be and where they want to gather, well, you can put in the local barista or the startup coffee shop or artisan bakery or whatever it is, creative studio, as your ground floor tenant. And, and the footfall and the revenue and the security that they have is the people that you're bringing to that place. It's not about that big balance sheet anymore because we know that those big balance sheets in this new world don't mean anything anymore. Goodbye, Arcadia. Goodbye, Debenhams. You know, good pretty almost goodbye a house of Fraser. you know mm. the, 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 these things don't matter anymore it's about how attractive you make the place and this yeah. homogenous high street now, don't get me wrong there's a place that costs a cost of, cost of coffee but the problem is it's where is that cost of coffee arriving to and but, what to, but that- to be honest though but why are we talking about place making as if it's a new thing now like all successful cities anywhere that's anywhere that's worth you know <laughs> that has stood the test of time is a place it's a place making thing i you know that there, there is this there is this thing unfortunately with a with a lot of people where it's it this is a kind of almost like a branding repivot like and, and you know everyone's talking about this as, as like they've just discovered cheese or something like that it, it's this place making is in it's in inherent in what we do like we create spaces it's like it, it's almost like you don't even need to kind of say it, but it does. I know that there's a lot of curation and a lot of hard work that goes into this, but this is our lifeblood, you know. And you know, to, to, it, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be treating this like it's just a one new thing. It's like it should just be a given. No, I'd, be in, I'd be interested in what sort of what Holly has to say about um, sorry the introduction of patient capital into this because patient capital is allowing us to have this conversation about placemaking, about thinking about the future. And I'd be sort of quite interested to see what she's seen coming through from that sort of area. Um, I don't know what you mean by patient capital, I have to say. What, what do you mean by patient well, capital? Well, sort of long, long-term long investors. I mean, in the past we had, we wouldn't, it was sort of patient capital, we had obviously the biggest states, but now we've got LNG and MNG and Aviva and all these sort of guys who are in it for the long term and who are prepared to, you know, indulge us, if you like, in talking about placemaking so that they know that what they've got um, is workable now, in 10 years time, and in 100 years time. Yeah, so I think, I think everything that's coming forward in terms of the, in terms of the major regeneration schemes, obviously, they are coming forward with a mix of uses and with a mix of spaces. I think um, some of the places that are coming forward with the mix of spaces are causing us and some of the flexibility around use classes is causing everyone a, a, a bit of time to pause about it in terms of what is it that you're applying for because particularly with the flexibility of the uses and the new use class that's been brought in the new use class e which combines retail and offices and 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 gyms all under the same the same use class and you can switch them around without needing consent it's causing planners and planning authorities a bit of issue in terms of how do we work out what we're consenting and how is it, is it gonna be the same now as it is in the future? And it shouldn't be because we're trying to get this flexibility and we're trying to make sure that things can move as markets move and as people's demands move. But how do you make sure that the places are gonna have enough jobs and enough shops when it, it's all a moving feast? And I think that's a bit of a challenge that us planners and policy people are trying to get their heads around. Um, and I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we've got the tools in place to do it but as a professional, and I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay. Certainly my, my local how authority co- planning colleagues are not there yet. How are your conversations um, when you're speaking to planners about it? Have you noticed that they're changing? Like, have you noticed that they sort of changed over the last year or, or certainly last six months at all or, or not? Is it still the same? Not yet. I think, um, I think everybody thinks that everything's just going to go back to normal and we're probably just going to proceed um, as we were. I don't think this step change has happened. I, I don't personally, I haven't seen that happening. I think I think flexibility is, is causing issues and people like to pin things down. I think where we've got a flexibility of a use class, I've got local authority planners who want to pin it down. They want to know exactly what it is and what it's going to stay at. And they don't want this flexibility. They want to be able to define what it is and know what its impacts are and know what it's going to be. 
and it's a it's a brave new world for all of us that we need to kind of let things organically change and live with them and, and be okay with that um but i don't think we're there yet i think i think i think that's a really interesting point holly because i, I you know, one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we have whether you're talking about co-living or whether you're talking about mixed use is actually that the policy doesn't keep up with the realities of what people want need live and how the world has changed and how technologies change that 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 sort of um, need for flexibility and adaptability and it's it's a big you know it's, it's a pity that you know your development plan takes five years just to be written and by the time it's uh, and by the time it's going up for adoption uh, the world has changed again and it's already out of date so they start the process all over again it becomes groundhog day um, but start because I'm conscious of time I just want there's one point that I just uh, that sort of Neil raised earlier which was uh, which is about you know we're talking about place making like it's a new thing well the, the, you're right it isn't a new thing but we, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, seem to have forgotten that because, you know, the whole, the, you know, I was talking about homogenous high streets. Well, you know, whether you were in Bracknell or whether you were in Marleybone, Costa, Pret, Holland and Barrett, Boots, you know, you, it, didn't, it almost didn't really matter anymore because there was no character. You know, the, the buildings might have looked a little bit different for sure. But, you know, what was on offer was pretty much the same wherever you went in the country. Yeah. And, and I think... Yeah. I think so we sort of lost our way. And I think what, what's now happened is it's like finding God again, isn't it? You suddenly turned around and realized, well, do you know what? Actually, it's okay to have a little bit of faith in the community and about letting that be an organic thing and let them, I mean, you know, I don't go back home that much, but I don't think they, they allow me back home that much. But um, one of the things I've noticed back in um, back in where I grew up in, in Cork down the south of Ireland is that you go along the high street there, the main high street called Patrick Street. And what was once Oasis and what was once, well, super dry is still there, but what was once all these change, chains have now become local businesses and local startups. And they've done their own cafe. They've done their own uh, you know, bakery, what have you. And they're bloody good. And, and, and they're paying their rent and they're driving footfall and they're creating interest. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, and so I think we're rediscovering placemaking is I think the thing in institutional capital is, is, is well. I think, I think that, I mean, the thing that I find, you know, and I've spoken to peers about this as well, it, you know, what's, what's infused me, certainly in the, you know, the last kind of three or four months is that, you know, unfortunately with the failure of, of these big chains and the, you know, the kind of the, the high street as we know it, is that is an unbelievable opportunity to breathe life back into city centres. Um, and, you know, how you repurpose those, how you build in mixed use, how you create it, all of that piece, suddenly we're not going to get identical streets. And we can have, you'll know if you're, you know, you're in Birmingham, you'll know if you're in, you know, the difference between kind of say Birmingham and say Coventry or something like that, where everything will have a sense of place and, it'll, you know, there'll be different ways and different ways of, of repurposing you know, just failed, you know, big behemoths in, in the centres of, uh, in centres of cities. So cities will endure. Yeah, you know, they always have, they always will, because, it, you know, the whole purpose of a city, it's concentration of capital, it's concentration of people and going back to your point, and it's, it's about, you know, being, you know, meeting people, having that social interaction and stuff, but it's, but it's more than that, you know, it's the fact that, you know, you're, you're there collectively and you kind of, there's the buzz and things like that. So, it, this will this will just be an unbelievable opportunity that we cannot pass up that you know that it's just it's just ripe for the picking and it's it, it's just I mean it's just incredibly exciting I mean I said that already but it, it and it really really is one of those things where just suddenly bang like the city centers are going to be these things that aren't just sort of hollow out hollowed out on a Friday or Saturday night you have to watch where you're going because you know you, you get beaten up or you know you get get kind of run over by a rickshaw or something it's in now, now you're going to really have something that has some kind of vibrancy of, of the organically developed cities and towns that, that work you know and we can re, we can copy those we can use those as case studies to to really learn and create something in you it's 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 going to be amazing no doubt on that note the time has sped by so we're already up to 60 minutes or so i do want to just ask a question that's come in it's slightly left field but we did touch on it uh, earlier from erica tarka so whoever wants to take this just uh, just shout out question is do you think co-living will move away from the similar design model of purpose-built student accommodation i think it's quite a fair question because you know i've heard co-living i think um, described as student housing as with a facelift as yeah. one but um 
Would anyone like to take that take that question, Richard? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if I may, um, yeah. Again, I'm only speaking. I can only speak for what we're doing. Um, we purposely target design standards and space standards above what the GLA are looking for. Um, we do not believe in cluster flats, um, but what, we, what we're trying to do is, the way we talk about it, is we talk about how do we make the living space, the space that you use on a day-to-day -day basis as efficient as it can be, um, but recognizing that the, amino, the amenity things, like the excess space and the balconies or what, what have you, that instead of putting you know, bicycles and, and clotheslines on that, what we're doing is we're trying to congregate them into communal spaces or shared spaces that actually work to bring people together, but can also be managed and controlled. So when we're in COVID times, you, know, you can control the amount of people, you can have the consolidated cleaning regime, you can have all the things that allow that to be a usable but safe space, but not... But not um, you know, not having shared kitchens on every floor and shared living spaces on every floor because that, that for us, doesn't work in a post-COVID world. Yeah, maybe not formulaic. Okay. I mean, I just, just, to, just one thing on, on the Erica thing. I mean, there, there, is, there is no doubt. Like, co-living will morph into other stuff. Um, and this, the, there's, the, there are owners and there are operators out there that are much smarter than before. I know that borrows a Amala's kind of quote as well. But... But it's, there's no doubt, there are some brands out there now that are completely dialed into this and really interrogate how people want to live and, and, that, and they will be the future. There's, you know, that's, that's a fact. Thank you. <laughs> we haven't <laughs> talked about uh, youth classes at all, but I'll give this one a quick mention from, I think it's probably Dexter Moran Associates. Quite simply, segregated youth classes need to be abandoned. Class E needs to go further. Okay, on that note, a big, big thank you to every contributor uh, that we've had, to Richard, Owen, Neil, Holly and Marlowe's. Um, if you were wondering, the person that has never tasted alcohol through their lips is Owen, Owen Conroy. And Jackson. the person who has lived with the parents of a fellow contributor is Marlowe's. It's amazing what you find out on a on a on a webinar, hey? Thank you for <laughs> offering uh, that up to give it uh, a bit of personality. Um, our next webinar is tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, which perhaps is a good follow-on from the conversation today, all about repurposing, hosted by my colleague uh, George. So do sign up for that if you haven't uh, already. And then in the afternoon, sustainability, again, it uh, was mentioned on this mixed use uh, webinar, which is hosted by Catherine Lequenza of Hokuso. That's at 2 p.m. tomorrow. OK, I hope you've enjoyed the, the webinars, obviously building up to the big event mentioned earlier, the Urban Living Festival, the 7th to the 8th of July. If you're looking to get involved uh, in that, do speak to my colleague, Katie Houghton. Her contact details are there. And just to say a big, big thank you for attending. I hope you managed to, uh, to get some knowledge and some takeaways to pop into your individual businesses. And by all means, get in touch with our contributors uh, today. Uh, their LinkedIn profiles are in the chat. And I'll see you soon, probably in the morning, on the uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you.